I'm telling you, I watched that garbage last night. 162 three-pointers in two games. They play a style of play. They don't care. They don't care about entertaining the fans. They don't care about competing. Everybody's getting paid. Jack up threes. And, and LeBron, bring your little baby boy to work today, and we'll throw him out on the court, and everybody act like it's a big deal. WNBA. I got, them, I got them on the heels of the NBA. They At least they care. Your thoughts? I, I will give you credit, Whitlock. You stand by your women. You really do. But this is a question <laughs> of passion versus proficiency. Because your general point, I think, is spot on. I, I mean, look, I know guys are injured and, and certain guys are always injured. But when you have load management going on, in the first few games, if not weeks of the season, that is an issue. In an era, get this, in an era where they fly private, uh, they never have to wait for their luggage to be picked up, basically. They get driven to five-star hotels. They don't even play that many back-to-back -back games anymore. The four games and five nights, which used to be a staple of the NBA, I think that's been legislated out. I, I remember a couple months ago, Michael Thompson on the local ESPN affiliate talking about his rookie year early in his NBA run as the number one pick. Did you know those guys not only had to fly commercial, they had to wash their own uniforms after the games. They would literally have to go into their hotel rooms, <laughs> get a little soap, get the bathtub and soak their uniform and then hang dry it. And then off to the game they went. So when I hear these guys talking about the wear and tear, it's ridiculous. And Jason, I'm like you. Growing up in the 80s, you can make an argument that the NBA, because the Lakers were the winningest team that I chose to root for, was my favorite sport. And I remember every year, right around late September, early October, training camp would start. Lakers would have their camp at Loyola, Marymount, or Hawaii. And then the NBA would have what eventually called the McDonald's Cup. A high-profile NBA team would go to Europe and play a game and be on TNT or TBS, and it was exciting. I'd watch all of it. So last night, fast forward to 2024, after the conclusion of the thrilling what in the name of Sam Houston Florida International game, uh, I flipped over to the Laker game out of curiosity. Jason, I didn't last as long as Michael Spinks against Mike Tyson. I think in about 90 seconds, it's okay, I tried. I tried. I'll talk. We'll talk about Bronny. I'll watch the highlights. What they have done to this league, and Jason, a lot of people will give you a lot of reasons why we are at this point. And they'll talk about LeBron. They'll talk about Adam Silver. But I think one of the biggest culprits is Greg Popovich. When he started making load management acceptable and a part of every team's game plan, with no respect for the fans, and then Popovich waving or wagging the finger politically at people, I think that's had a pretty good amount to do with guys like me saying, okay, I'm out. Yeah, he did that. He had those that cast of veteran guys, Tim Duncan, Manu Ginobili. Uh, Tony Parker was still kind of in his prime. But you're right. Uh, he, he did start it. I, 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 I can't give him... Full blend. I wouldn't say he's most responsible, but he certainly he was he's considered the best coach in the NBA, and he's definitely a big part of it. But but I, I just want to know this whole three pointer thing. Watching guys jack up three pointers, you can't tell me <clears throat> that the lack of diversity in playing style. The the, the Celtics and the Lakers had unique playing styles. Magic Johnson was going to play with a lot of pace, and then if they couldn't get the fast break going, couldn't get an early bucket, they'd throw it into Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. The, the Celtics played a half-court game with Larry Bird and Kevin McHale and Robert Parrish, and they had decent guards, Dennis Johnson, Danny Ainge. The Pistons were sort of a hybrid. They were going to kill you with defense and a bunch of athletes that could, def that could defend virtually any position. It, it it there was unique styles of play that there was contrast. Everybody now just stands around the three point line and jacks up threes, and and I'm supposed to be entertained by this. I'm not. I'm I'm just not. Who 
Does anybody have a low post game? Does anybody? I know Anthony Davis dunks a lot, but is there a Kevin McHale in this league? Is there a Buck Williams in this league? Is there a Bernard King, a Wayman Tisdale? Is there is there any? I, I just don't see it. And and I just, they're all making so much money, and it's all so easy, and all the resistance has been removed. I just don't think the players just don't care that much. That looked like an overblown all-star game to me, both of those games. And and I just didn't have much interest. And in, in the three minutes that LeBron and Bronny were on the court were a joke to me. Steve, I want to play this clip of, and again, this is this make-believe world we've built uh, throughout sports where uh, people can just create their own narrative. LeBron James, after the game last night, said that everybody was rooting against him his rookie year. And I'm like, what is he talking about? Play the clip. Hey, LeBron, uh, do you remember what it felt like in that moment, your NBA debut, and what Bronny was feeling tonight? And can you explain that feeling? Um, yeah, I definitely remember that moment. Um, it was very stressful. It was very stressful for me. Um, didn't get much sleep the night before. Didn't get much sleep during my during my pre, my pregame nap. <clears throat> I was extremely nervous. Um, you know, I, could, I felt the world of the game of basketball on my shoulders, and I felt like um, kind of pretty much everyone besides my family and friends wanted me to fail, you know. So, um, and I just kind of channeled that in. I kind of was just very quiet the day of the game, and all the way up until the, the, all the, way up until the, the, the ball went, uh, you know, went up in the air for the tip ball, I was nervous. My stomach was turning, whatever the case may be. So, uh, but once the game started, uh, I guess the rest is history. You can kind of go back and rewatch the game if you want to. Did you know that 17 Christians are killed for their faith every day in Nigeria? Join us and make a difference to help save lives. Visit equippingthepersecuted.org now to start your monthly donation, which will help create sustainable hope and take action to help protect an orphan or care for a widow. Everybody was rooting against LeBron. Really? A high school kid from that was there to save the league. I I remember it just the opposite. Everybody was rooting for LeBron. Uh, Jason, first of all, I want to point one thing out. I will not let the slander of Dennis Johnson go unnoticed here. He's a Hall of Famer, <laughs> and Danny Ainge was a damn good two guard. So shout out to a really good yes he was backcourt there in Boston. Jason, I, I remember the first time I ever heard of LeBron James. I was waiting for a flight to go to Philadelphia. Doug Fisher and I had just started Max Boxing. We were going to do a day trip to go see Bernard Hopkins in preparation for his fight against Felix Trinidad. We got real good access. We were tight with the camp. And for years, I was a subscriber to perhaps the most influential basketball magazine of that era, Slam. And so I took it on my flight, and I'm flipping through it. And this is probably July of 2001 so this is after his sophomore year and they wrote a little piece it wasn't a huge article he didn't make the cover but they talked about this young kid out of akron ohio and and i give slam magazine a lot of credit they said this will be one of the greatest players ever and maybe one of the greatest prospects of all time lebron james and i still recall the legend beginning right around that time because the number one player that year was a guy by the name of Lenny Cook with an E. Everyone thought he was going to be the presumptive next great one. And then at the ABCD Adidas camp that year, and I think it was in New Jersey, that this guy out of Akron, Ohio, took over the camp. And everybody knew that's the guy. And that's when it began. And it was so hype, Jason, if you remember, ESPN was showing his high school games. Not highlights. They were literally broadcasting his high school games. So this whole notion that somehow he's this Horatio Alger story that came out of nowhere, like it's Fernando Valenzuela in 1981. Again, it's another false narrative. And what's maddening about it is he's the one creating it, and the media members just nod along like sheep. Uh, uh, Charles Barkley nailed it last night that what last night was was a Nike commercial. That's why the Griffies were flown in. Bar Barkley absolutely nailed it. And and 
Uh, Nike did have a commercial, uh, LeBron hazing Bronny. Uh, let's play that ad. All right, man, I got you. Yo. Come on. Hey, Rook. You better not be late. Yo, are you serious? Come on, man. Hey, clean up my driveway. It's a mess. Yo, you're too old for this. What's going on, bro? Come on. You way too old for this, man. Yo, Bryce, where your keys at? The, the, it's cute ad, puts a little smile on my face, but it's a gimmick, man. They, they've the whole it, it's real world basketball edition. This is this is reality TV manipulated. It, it's desperate fathers and sons, housewives, or what? I don't know what. It, your thoughts. Uh, Jason, doesn't Nike always put out like these shirts with a swoosh and a um, a slogan like "Witness" or "Her Story"? Yeah. This one here, instead of "Earned, Not Given," should say "Given, Not Earned." I, I don't really know. Okay, so <laughs> we did this thing. It happened on opening night. We gave a G League caliber player at best minutes. Now what? Now it's just another eighty-one games of a slog. Uh, Jason, I've told you this before. There was a time, specifically during, I would say even past Magic, during the social media era, when Kobe Bryant was at his absolute apex, and perhaps even during the Shaq-Kobe era, the Lakers were the most unifying force in our city in sports because they were winning titles. As popular as the Dodgers were for a long time, they did not win a World Series from 88 to the COVID season. Rams and Raiders had moved on. Hockey is hockey. So I always vividly recall that right around late April, early May, when the playoffs would begin and the Lakers would make their march, one thing that was ubiquitous in our city as you're driving around were car flags. Remember those things? People would attach them on their window. And it was almost like the spring bloom of purple and gold. And you'd see them all around the city. And no matter what, cultural or racial differences we had as a city we loved our lakers jason i can tell you this right now as someone who's still right in the heart of the city not too far from the crypto.com center nobody cares I, there's an apathy towards this team that i have never felt in all my years as a sports fan if you enjoyed that video be sure to hit the like button and subscribe so you never miss a moment of fearless